Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean, <clears throat> Sean Kane Holland. I'm the uh, Access Nature and Disability Advocate with Pinelands Preservation Alliance. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, for this edition of the uh, Access Nature Forum. Uh, today we are uh, joined by Joe Zitsky, who's uh, the program manager at the Northwest or Northeast, sorry, Northeast ADA Center, <clears throat> uh, Mid Atlantic, uh, who will be discussing. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and how it applies to uh, the communications of state, local businesses, and, and nonprofits. Uh, because uh, as we've learned, you know, providing folks individual, you know, individuals with uh, you know the proper information and you know uh, available information, accessible information, is really important and crucial so they can learn uh, what's available to them and, and where to go. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Joe now, so we can. Uh, begin his presentation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me join and welcome everybody. I, I will also do a quick introduction. I'll be uh, presenting um, for the our next hour or so together. Uh, I am joined <clears throat> by my colleague who is assisting with the chat, Jennifer Perry, who is also at the Northeast ADA Center. Jennifer, you just say hello so people hear your sure. voice. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, happy to be here today. And I will also mention, since I'm monitoring the chat, there was a question, Joe, about getting copies of the materials. So you will be receiving uh, um, a, a PDF of the slides that Joe is using after the training today. <laughs> Exactly. And that's a great question because we are going to cover a lot of information. And so understandably, it might be a little bit overwhelming for some people or some people may feel, oh, gosh, I, I missed that. What was that? You will get a copy of the slides as a PDF. Um, so you'll have the, the core information that we're going to talk about today. Um, you'll also receive, <clears throat> pardon me, a uh, link in that email that will have a training evaluation survey. Uh, and if you would take the time to complete it, it would be appreciated. With that being said, we'll begin the presentation. Obviously you heard who I am. I'm the program manager at the Northeast ADA Center. I'm also someone who has a disability myself. I am someone who is blind. And uh, with that being the case, I use assistive technology. And so that's part of the reason why uh, I often explore uh, in my professional work areas of accessibility and electronic access um, as someone who uses different assistive technology to inter uh, face and interact with uh, things I need to do for work. And of course, outside of that as well, in my personal life, um, to uh, do what I need to do as a member of the community. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Northeast ADA, I'll just provide a very brief uh, sketch. The Northeast ADA Center is one of 10 centers around the country that have the same mission to provide training, technical assistance, and research on the Americans with Disabilities Act and uh, some other disability-related laws. But our primary focus is on the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's our Specialty. So we provide technical assistance through our website, uh, email, and also through the 1-800 number, 1-800-949-4232. That uh, is a phone number. It's staffed by a live person uh, when we're open during regular business hours. Uh, when you call that line, the what you discuss, the questions you ask, or whatever you may call to inquire about is kept strictly confidential. We are not a part of the federal government. Uh, we are not an advocate organization. We are funded by um, the National Institute of Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research to provide technical assistance, which is um, actually a mandate within the ADA itself that the federal government find different ways to provide technical assistance. So um, that's let, that lets you know <clears throat> when you call us, your information will be kept confidential and private. And also keep in mind that when you call us, we don't provide legal advice or counsel. We are there just to provide technical assistance. So um, if you need, as an organization for some reason, legal representation, um, we can maybe refer you to various different potential resources, but we do not provide legal advice. That being said, we'll start diving into our content uh, right away. And 
one place bef before we get into talking about the why or how of accessibility, it's important to keep in mind where we're really beginning is with people, right? And individuals who have disabilities come in all shapes and sizes, experiences. Some people are born with their disabilities. Other people acquire their disabilities as children, as adults. It might be through injury, illness, accident, many different ways, but there are a lot of different experiences of disability. And with that, there are a lot of different ways that people with disabilities will use and experience the web. Some people, for example, myself, may use assistive technology to interact with the web. Um, it might take very different forms, um, and I'll show you some examples of assistive technology in just a moment, but there are people with disabilities who may not use assistive technology, but maybe because of a learning disability or perhaps a cognitive disability may have difficulty processing information. So when we think about accessibility, keep in mind, yes, there are um, what we'll largely talk about today is some of the technical aspects of it. However, um, it's also about just trying to make sure your messages get to people in a way they can understand and interact with whatever material is being shared. So I spoke about uh, people using assistive technology and I'll, I'll show in a minute some types of assistive technology that are more specialized um, for particular individuals with particular types of disabilities. But we have here on this slide a screenshot from an iPhone of the accessibility settings. And it's important uh, for people either putting information on the web or who may be designers, whatever your role might be, to keep in mind that there is a lot of off-the-shelf technology people use, people with disabilities, that's built into everyday products. So for iPhone, there's you know accessibility, there's voiceover. On the Android platform, for example, there is TalkBack, which is uh, one of the names of their accessibility programs. There are controls to change the screen size, to change um, how the screen reacts to someone's touch, if they need to touch the screen. There are a lot of different tools, but keep in mind that uh, some of the tools people use to interact are built into your everyday off-the-shelf products. Now, of course, you also have uh, assistive technology that is a little more specialized that you won't find in your Best Buy or... Um, Costco or Walmart, right? Um, there's technology like you see on this slide here, things like a refreshable Braille display, which um, has pins that go up and down to uh, mimic and produce Braille for people who are blind or low vision. Um, there have a laptop stand here with movable armrests. Uh, you have uh, and a large keyboard on the slide. There's a mouth stick. Um, there's different technology. And for example, with a mouth stick, someone who doesn't have use of their hands or arms may use that in place of a mouse in order to uh, control and manipulate a computer or a cell phone. Uh, someone may not have uh, or may have an issue with dexterity. And so they may need a keyboard with a different arrangement or perhaps a larger keyboard than what uh, typically would be purchased. And again, that's a form of assistive technology and a way that people with disabilities may choose to interact with the web as well as uh, electronic communication in general or their mobile phone technology. So keep in mind, people with disabilities will use different strategies to interact with the web. So now that we've talked about the people, let me set up a, a brief conversation about sort of the why of accessibility. And to do that, uh, obviously being someone from the Northeast ADA Center, I would like to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. You probably have heard of it, and if you signed up for this webinar, you obviously have. The Americans with Disabilities Act 
it was a civil rights law passed in 1990 and amended in 2008. It was a really a landmark achievement in terms of civil rights, particularly for people with disabilities. It was the first law um, that was a national law that applied to people with all types of disabilities. And it was the first in the world at the time. And its intent was to increase the inclusion of people with disabilities through ensuring equal access and equal opportunity to be a part of the community. And that covered everything from employment to the access to state and local government services and activities to the goods and services of business. And there's different um, ways that equal access and equal opportunity is meant to be realized. We're going to focus today um, for our purposes, a little bit on Title Two and Three, which I will discuss now, <clears throat> which uh, set some uh, important requirements. So Title Two is the part of the law that deals with state and local government entities. So it does not apply to the federal government that's covered in a separate law called the Rehabilitation Act. But for uh, Title Two of the ADA, it, no, it did various things, and I captured some of the ones that are most important or relevant to our conversation on this slide. First, it, there was a general non-discrimination requirement, and that was uh, something that came from an earlier law called Section 504. But two other requirements, non-discrimination requirements, that are important to know <clears throat> from Title II are addressed as effective communication and reasonable modification. Effective communication essentially uh, touches on the fact that people with disabilities should have the same opportunity to have an equal access to communication services of a state or local government. Now for Title II, which is what we're talking about right at the moment, the primary consideration of what type of effective communication goes to the person with a disability. And that means that for covered entities like a, a community college, which would be state or local government uh, or an instrumentality of it, your public library, your city office, they need to provide uh, an auxiliary aid or service. That's a, a tool to facilitate effective communication that the individual prefers. So that's important to know. Reasonable modifications, on the other hand, means that a covered entity might need to change the way they do things to ensure that they don't discriminate against a person with a disability. It's a change to a policy, practice, or procedure. So again, the way that something is done may need some altering to ensure that discrimination does not take place. Now for Title III, it's actually fairly similar. <clears throat> the language is a little bit different um, and the uh, who is covered is different, but some of the concepts are, are fairly similar. Title III deals with what are known as public accommodations. And one somewhat shorthand for that, you could think of as businesses and nonprofits, places that are open to the public and engage in commerce, um, religious, Entities are exempt from Title III, but almost any other no, any other nonprofit is going to be covered under this uh, part of the law. And for Title III, the focus is on equal access to goods and services. So for Title II, they were looking at equal access to the programs and services and activities of state and local governments. For Title III, we're looking at equal access to the goods and services of businesses and nonprofits. People with disabilities, again, need to be able to engage with the information, uh, products and goods and services, to have an equal opportunity to benefit from them. And that's uh, addressed in this area of the ADA as well. Also, Effective communication is, again, a requirement under Title III, and I'm going to actually speak more in depth about what effective communication means uh, in just a moment. I will say, unlike with Title II, 
which was, again, state and local government and related entities. Unlike Title II, <clears throat> Title III entities don't necessarily have to provide the preferred uh, uh, auxiliary aid or service for effective communication, but it must be effective. So the covered organization in this case does have to make sure that however they're making sure their communication access is equal, it actually is equal, even if it's not necessarily the first choice of the individual receiving the communication or interacting with the communication on the other end. As I said, though, I did want to just touch a little bit more on effective communication before we move on. So obviously, like in any situation or relationship, professional, personal, or otherwise, good communication is making sure that both sides or all sides involved are understood, right? So that it is clear and understandable to everyone involved in, in the situation. And the same is true for effective communication under the ADA. Obviously, we're talking about with Title II and three very specific uh, uh, situations related to organizations. But uh, the, <clears throat> pardon me, the information must be un understandable and uh, usable, if you will, by people with communication related disabilities. And often communication related <clears throat> disabilities um, affect several areas, hearing, vision, or speech. However, there is, a, again, the larger need to make sure that your communications in general are going to be accessible to people with disabilities, unless it would cause uh, undue, a fun, an undue burden on an organization. In other words, providing the effective communication, whether because of cost or because it would be such a significant uh, change or burden on a organization operationally, that would be the only exception for providing uh, effective communication. And for organizations, that it comes up in a lot of contexts. It really covers all types of communication, whether electronic, which we're talking about today, but it could also be communication that is paper-based. Uh, we had a comment before we started about uh, the need for organizations to know and be able to provide large print materials. That is an example of providing the correct auxiliary aid or service, the correct format for someone to use. It also deals with face-to-face -face interactions as well as with uh, social media and other media forms, videos, recordings, and the like. So that is sort of the background information. Let's review what exactly the ADA has to say about rules uh, regarding the web. Title II does now have specific regulations for web accessibility and what a Title II organization has to provide. It was published earlier this year, um, in uh, published in April, and it set standards that Title II organizations, which are called public entities, pardon me, I realize I didn't mention that earlier, that public entities must meet. And depending on the size of an organization, there are different deadlines uh, for organization uh, covered entities that are a little bit larger. So ones with more than 50,000 persons, those uh, must comply with the new regulations by 2026. So just a little over a year away at this point, it's hard to believe it's late 2024, but a little over a year and a half away. For smaller organizations, they have a longer uh, grace period to comply. They have until April 26th of 2027. And as I mentioned, there are now specific standards laid out. They use a standard called WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, level AA 2.1. And I won't go into super detail about those, but I will mention a little bit what those are. Uh, 
uh, in just a second. So again, that will apply to the websites as well as mobile apps um, that are developed by these covered organizations, again, related to Title II specifically. There are some exemptions to that. I won't spend a lot of time on this slide um, due to time, but be aware there are some small exceptions in terms of art, some archived materials and uh, media that's created by third party platforms and so forth. But again, I won't spend a lot of time on that today um, in the interest of uh, leaving time for questions. But again, you'll have slides <clears throat> as a PDF from the presentation. Okay. So, <clears throat> pardon me one moment. So for Title Three, however, that was Title II. We have explicit standards based on Title II now from the Department of Justice. For Title Three, we don't have those explicit standards. However, we now have guidelines. There's been a long history of trying to create re regulations for businesses and web accessibility. There's been stops and starts off and on for a number of years. While we don't have official standards at this point, we do know that there are, if you will, unofficial standards or requirements. The Department of Justice, who enforces mo most of Title II and Three under the ADA, holds that websites do need to be accessible by covered entities, whether that's Title II or Three, And we also see through private lawsuits that people take that uh, courts also hold websites must be accessible. So while there isn't an official standard you could point to now, as with Title II, we do know that uh, having an accessible web presence is important and to be able to provide accessible electronic communication is important. For Title III, what we've seen is that, again, it's based around that standard I just mentioned, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG. So let me just share a little bit about what those are so you have a little uh, better idea. Essentially, it's an international standard uh, that is set up by the um, Web Accessibility Initiative of the World Wide Web Consortium, which is not easy to say, I, I, will, I will say. But it's a standard that's based around uh, testable statements known as criteria to measure and judge through yes or no answers whether or how much a particular website or piece of electronic information is accessible. Right now, they're on version 2.2, and uh, version 3 is in development, and I believe may be released next year. But right now, through ADA Title II regulations, they focus on version 2.1. And for Title III, while there's no official standards, it's more just tied to these WCAG in general. I mentioned that because it brings up an important issue to realize that technology changes so much more rapidly than legislation can. So what's presented through the ADA is intended to sort of to be a baseline. It's not meant to be necessarily uh, the, the optimal level for everybody. Um, and legislation simply just cannot keep up with the ch speed of changing technology. But we have minimum standards we know we can meet and aim for. There are four ideas or core principles in WCAG that are related to accessibility that are meant for websites, but also apply to electronic documents or social media. And I think in, to communication in general. So I do wanna highlight those. The first, is known as perceivable. And as you have and see on the slides, it really means that a person on the other end, person with a disability in this case, can get uh, the content 
um, and to the user in a way that they can understand it. So someone perhaps like myself, for example, may have a visual disability, or perhaps someone has color blindness, or perhaps someone is deaf or hard of hearing, or perhaps someone has a learning disability, as I mentioned earlier. Having um, those disabilities means that you need to perceive information, you need to take in information sometimes in a different way compared to other individuals. So having things on a website like captioning or transcripts for video or audio content, that will make it accessible for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Having labels on web pages for visual elements will help people who are blind or low vision who may use assistive technology like a screen reader to access the web. Making sure that important information is not uh, shown or conveyed only by color will help people who may have issues with color blindness to make sure that um, if someone can't see a, a differentiation in color, they're able to still uh, perceive the information that's being communicated. The second principle is being operable. In other words, the interface itself doesn't require actions that the user can't perform. So let's say someone is using a screen reader and maybe they're someone who's low vision. And so they don't have enough usable vision, let's say, but they use a screen reader. And if you're not familiar with it, a screen reader will literally read the information on your screen, your computer screen, as you move the focus around the screen. For me, uh, for example, you would use tabs or uh, the tab key quite a lot or arrow keys. If there's a element on a page that requires someone to click, um, instead of hitting enter, they click a mouse rather than pressing enter, that could be a potential barrier. Um, or if you're using flashing content on your screen. If it flashes at a certain rate, it can be a barrier for someone who may have a condition that may cause seizures because flashing images, depending on the rate, can uh, induce or make someone more likely to have a seizure. So you want to, for example, on in terms of websites, make sure that there are tips and tools to help someone navigate a page, what they call skip to links. You want to make sure that someone doesn't have to use a mouse in order to access all the elements on a page. You want to make sure that they're accessible by keyboard. And um, you want to also make sure that uh, if you have timing mechanisms, for example, like you must put in such and such information within two minutes or one minute that um, there is a way for people to extend that time if needed, because some people may simply take longer to interact with an element uh, than uh, others individuals might. Understandable. Get is the principle that gets to the simple concept that the end user must be able, obviously, to understand the information as well as be able to operate it. So this is where you heard Sean mention as we started the importance of language. This is one of those areas where organization, structuring are very important. And using the language that's most appropriate, but is it also as simple and as concrete as possible is used. People literally need to be able to understand what you're saying and be able to follow a consistency in design to know what to expect, which is because better headings, better labeling of elements will make it easier for everybody, not just someone with a learning disability or a cognitive disability to follow and use a web page or other uh, electronic information that you have. Robust is the principle that technologies change. And so part of good design and accessible design is understanding that people will use your information through different platforms. Some people like to use Chrome, other people use Edge, uh, other people use Firefox. 
Some people use their computers. Other, a lot of almost everybody uses their cell phones these days, or some people use tablets. It's important when someone's designing web pages to keep those things in mind. And so that for people currently using it, but also for future users, what you set up is as robust and accessible as possible for people to be able to get your key information. So I'm gonna pause here. The next sort of half of what we're gonna talk about is literal different types of content and tips for making them accessible. But before I make that transition, Jen, are there any comments we should address? And of course we will have time at the end for questions as well. Um, there, there were a few, but I, just as a point of clarification, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone who was looking for captioning um, knows that there is a uh, button on the bottom, at least on my laptop, the bottom right-hand side of my screen that says show captions. And if you click on that, it enables captions. And then I was also told that if you click on the more option or the more tab, um, I can see there's a transcript uh, that pops up to allow people to follow along in case anyone was looking for that. And Joe, in terms of questions, um, just real quickly, since you, before you move on to the next topic, uh, we did have a question about if um, does effective communication have to be available all the time or just when requested, for example, large print? Ah, uh, good question. The ability to communicate, if, this is a little tricky answer. It should be available whenever it's requested. Um, and it depends on the type of communication, right? If you're talking about a website, and what would be equally effective on a website? Part of it, part of that means that it's available you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? It used to be in earlier uh, times under the ADA, let's say a business had something where, you know, if you need assistance, you can call us and, you know, maybe the web, the business knew our, our, our sign out, you know, our purchasing process isn't accessible, but people who have a disability can call and customer service can do their purchases for them. But maybe customer service was only operating nine to five. That sort of used to be uh, seen as an effective alternative. However, over the years, the expectation for websites, because they're really meant to be active, they're interactive 24 hours a day, they need to sort of be accessible from the start. But now, if you need communication from a business, let's say you need a bill uh, from a business, and typically they may send out electronic uh, formats, um, or perhaps you're just someone who needs a paper format, you have the right to request that paper format as a large print, and they should be able to provide it uh, on need. Now, it might be Let's say a business doesn't send paper anymore. They only use electronic communication, which is probably how more and more places are beginning to operate. In that case, the business does need to make sure that their format, their email or whatever means of communication it is, is done to in an accessible way. So the answer to the question is, you know, organizations need to be prepared uh, whenever they're requested to provide effective communication. But um, as a default, they don't necessarily have to send large print materials to people, but they should be able to on request. That uh, is an excellent question. Go ahead. It was, and then they were just sim along the similar lines. There was another question we received that I'm going to hold to the end, but I think this one um, was, can a state refuse to provide uh, large print materials for things like program applications? basically saying that's too expensive the short answer is especially for a state um because that would be title two is no that's why i mentioned if, uh, you may recall something called primary consideration that's only for title two that's not for title three but essentially it places a much higher burden on title two entities to provide the preferred uh auxiliary aid or service someone requests if it's at all possible and saying you know providing an application to an individual in large print is cost too much money or to make that argument i i don't think it would really in today's 
day and age, I, that would not work, um, especially for a Title II entity. Um, I don't think that would be reasonable. All right. That's all I have, Joe. All right. Well, now let's get into some of the different forms of communication and how you can think and begin to work on making them more accessible to as many people as possible. What about audio content? Well, that's fairly straightforward. If something is an audio recording and obviously individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing or have some other issue uh, related to hearing might not be able to hear or interpret that information. So providing a written transcript um, is is the solution in that case. And so, you know, that comes as we were talking about here in terms of, of captioning. Uh, thank you, Jen, for pointing out the captioning button. I forgot to do that myself at the beginning. So when something is archived, it's easier, right? You can add video transcripts in or live captions into videos. If it's live, <clears throat> it can be a little bit more challenging and it depends on the platform. Some platforms like Zoom offer automatic captioning. Sometimes as an organization, you can pay for a live human captioner to provide the transcript. Um, and in some platforms, you can not all virtual platforms, but in some, you can provide ASL interpretation live as well. So depending on the platform and the material used, there are different ways to make audio content uh, more accessible to uh, someone with a communication disability. <clears throat> now, for social media, and pardon me, Jen, it should be the social media slide. For some reason, I think my, yes. uh, okay, very good. My technology, I think, went past the slide I thought I, I, I did. Anyway, for social media, you know, it's a day and age where so much of our information and the way organizations communicate is through social media, right? We have things like X, we have different versions or other alternative platforms to X. There's Facebook, there's Instagram, all these different platforms, which are wonderful tools and ways to communicate information. But when we use those, we just have to keep in mind some important tips, like always remember to include alt descriptions or alt tags for images. In other words, if you're sharing out a picture, you wanna make sure that for people who are visually impaired, there's an alternative way. And most platforms offer ways to add alt text for images. In other words, a short description of the key information to be found in, in an image. Uh, another, <clears throat> sort of simple tip, but something that's important. When you think of how often people use emojis, sometimes whether you have a disability or not, it's not always clear what someone is saying in an emoji. We may think it is, but it's not. So just a word of caution, a word to the wise. Certainly you can still use memes and emojis and such in your social media communications. However, Try to think of it sort of like salt, right? If you have some salt in in a dish, you you put a little salt on some French fries. Oh, that's good. But if you pour too much salt on it, yeah, salt is good. But you have too much, it, it ruins it. So you want to season season appropriately, if you will, with your social media in terms of using memes and emojis, um, so that for people using other technologies to access it, other than a screen, it's not too confusing. And even for those who do interact with media in a more traditional way, that it, again, some of your messaging is not lost. So be uh, careful in your seasoning, in your social media. In terms of the written content for social media, it's a, a few other things are important to keep in mind. The idea of language is important. You saw that in the WCAG standards. We talked about it. Uh, earlier, when Sean mentioned Rebecca Martin's presentation uh, last time, use language that is as clear to as many people as possible. And, you know, 
that is both in terms of your word choices and also in terms of avoiding too many abbreviations. I've tried to do that during this presentation, even though it's not social media. But other than ADA, I've tried to avoid you know shorthand. But even um, for other day-to-day -day communications, sometimes, again, sometimes you need an abbreviation, like Americans with Disabilities Act can be a long phrase. But if we're using abbreviations for the, you know, I'm blank. I'm trying to speak the abbreviation, but now my my brain is is, tri is tripping up on itself. You know, some of the things that like rolling on the floor laughing. If you, know, you may you know type that out or put that in a, a X or Instagram, <clears throat> something like that. Yes, a lot of people know if you could just go by the letters what that means, but not everybody will. So you want to make sure you don't use too many abbreviations if at all possible. Having text in all caps is difficult for some people to read, so avoiding that um, is an issue. When you have a hashtag, uh, having having it in what's called Pascal case is, is acceptable. And again, this is an issue, particularly for people using a screen reader. So let's say you had a hashtag, go team. If you wrote it without any capital letters, it would not sound the same to someone using a screen reader as it would uh, if you put in the capital letter. So Pascal case is where you capitalize each first letter of a word. So you would capitalize the word go and the word team, as you see on the slide in the presentation. Or you could use the camel case where you skip the first capitalization, but capitalize the other words. Both of those will read text as it's meant to be understood by uh, assistive technology, but putting all caps or no caps, if you're doing a hashtag, will not really be uh, able to be interpreted by most assistive technology correctly and in the right way. Now documents, another key area to look at. And on the slide here, we have a picture of a PDF uh, on a monitor. And of course, there are a lot of different uh, word processing programs. Primarily, people and businesses use either Microsoft or Google Docs. Some people, I suppose, do use Apple-based uh, products, but I found most businesses tend to use uh, Word and Office products. But these ideas are the same, regardless of the uh, software you're starting with. So, Making sure, again, any images that you use in your documents have alt images. In other words, alt images are those short descriptions of the important information in, in a graphic or image. And again, those are actually things that are not visible to the reader. And if someone was reading your web page, they're detectable by assistive technology, not necessarily by people reading the page. So keep that in mind. Structure is important. So as we were just discussing with keeping things simple, making sure that you have a consistent outline, a consistent format and presentation with headings, that helps to make documents accessible. If you're creating PDFs, and I will share a little bit more about PDFs in just a moment, don't use an image as a starting point. In other words, if you scan a paper document and create a PDF from that, it will not be accessible for most assistive technology because the technology itself will see that as an image, not as written documents. So when you're creating a PDF, start with you know, a doc file of some sort. So there's actual coding there for assistive technology to interpret. Then you wanna run um, uh, accessibility checks to make sure you know there's a good reading order in the PDF, et cetera. And so we'll talk more about that in just a moment, at least uh, to some degree. The next several slides are general tips uh, for creating accessible documents. So obviously you wanna start with a good font. In other words, one that doesn't have too many flourishes, uh, one that doesn't have serifs, you know, those little uh, tails that come out. So things like Calibri or Arial, <clears throat> you 
you know, those are good uh, fonts to use in terms of accessibility. You want to make sure that you have a good color contrast so that, um, you know, people are more easily able to discern the content. So black text on a white background, that would be an example versus, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> text on a background that has less contrast. You heard me mention this before, but avoiding using color is the only way to convey information. So if you have uh, a graph, let's say, that's part of a document or, you know, some information that's conveyed in a picture through color, you want to make sure there's an alternate way that information is being communicated to the end user. Typically, that would be through an alt text image description, but there may be other ways as well to put it actually in the body of the written text accompanying an image. <clears throat> you heard me already speak about having alt text. That is, again, something you add into a document for images and photos and the like. Um, if you're creating a document, you don't want the blank space to be created where someone is literally hit the enter key, you know, enter, 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 enter to get to the bottom of a page. It makes it more difficult for assistive technology to interpret. You want to use, you know, control enter, for example, to indicate a page break. You don't want to uh, try to create blank space uh, visually to get to the next page. Another language element that is important is, as well as you avoiding too many abbreviations if possible, if you're using acronyms, be sure to spell them out the first time they appear. Like For example, I've used ADA throughout, but we talked as well in the beginning about the Americans with Disabilities Act. If I had never said the full phrase out, Americans with Disabilities Act, I mean, likely you would have understood what I was referring to because you signed up for the webinar. But let's say you didn't sign up for the webinar, you were just a random person on the street, you wouldn't know what ADA was referring to. And the same is true in written communication. You want to make sure that when people first see an acronym, they know you're talking about, in my case, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and not, let's say, the American Dental Association or the American Diabetes Association, which uh, actually, we get calls from people who think that's what we are. So, it's again, it's important to spell out acronyms, especially when they first occur in a document. This is just a few more uh, quick tips on general starters for documents. If you're using links in your documents, be sure that they're clear in terms of describing what they are, rather than saying simply click here, for example which if someone was uh, using assistive technology, scanning through a document or web page, they, if they didn't, if they were just doing a quick scroll, they would not know what that link would take them to. But if it said, click here to go to our um, schedule for uh, plays, let's say you're a theater organization, you click, then people would know, all right, oh, I'm clicking here to look at the schedule of upcoming performances. So again, having that information uh, conveyed in the link itself is important. One basic thing, which I do want to highlight, which again may seem obvious, is making sure that Titles and headings are clear in terms of what they're trying to communicate or establish. That's true for the name of a file. If you're sharing a file with someone outside of your organization or even within your organization, or it's true if it's a web page, you want to make sure people know what the full title of the information being communicated is. These are just some tips on different word uh, things to be aware of when considering accessibility. I will say here, one of your best friends is the accessibility checker. It's a great starting point built into all Microsoft products um, that can run an initial check for accessibility. It's not perfect, 
it may not catch everything. And so that's where, as a creator, it's important for everyone to understand some of the basic things to be aware of that we've talked about. Um, but this is a list of different questions that certainly I would recommend going over uh, before sharing a document, especially anything that's supposed to be finalized or shared outside of your own organization. In terms of PDFs, it's not too different from document accessibility. The key is to start with an accessible document and convert it into a PDF. If the, the source material is accessible, the PDF is gonna be much, much simpler to make accessible. Um, so having things like headings, having uh, proper labels for images, these are all things that should be done really in the base document that you're creating, from which you're creating the PDF itself. Um, that will help you to have things tagged properly in terms of the reading order for assistive technology to interpret. And running the accessibility checker, again, with Adobe, they have a very good accessibility checker tool built in to Adobe for PDFs so that you can run a check and see where there may be flags uh, that come up. And as I said, it's not 100% perfect um, because there are things that can slip through, but it will set you on the right path. If, you be sh if you're sure to run Accessibility Checker, you will see uh, some of the issues that can come up with PDFs. So what's um, sort of Joe? I'm yes. sorry, this is Jen. I just want to let you know we're we have about five minutes left. Yep. Uh, so these are just some things to remember to take away uh, from today's conversation. Then we'll open it up for questions. So <clears throat> if you're a part of it, if you're coming at this from an individual point of view, there there is accessibility that can be built and created into all different kinds of electronic media content. Uh, as I mentioned, the Word and the document platforms have accessibility checker tools, things like YouTube, Facebook, X, uh, other similar clients. They all have different accessibility features of different degrees. Um, you know, investigate what those are or reach out to me if you have questions. I'm glad to answer them. But remember, if you're coming at this for, as a representative of an organization, Accessibility is sort of a team effort, right? It's not just one person who has to do it because documents, information is shared internally as well as externally. And so that's why it's so important to keep um, accessibility in mind as we're designing the content from the beginning because it makes it much, much easier. I'll leave these resources up as I think we'll open up for questions now um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, this is Jen. I'll just share one from the chat. Um, question was, does the ADA apply to state and local courts or evidence produced by other parties for court cases? That's a tricky question. Materials mm -hmm. that come from the court itself is going to be covered by Title II. So forms uh, and documents, yes. In terms of evidence produced, but let's say there are multiple litigants or you know, there's litigants in, the, in a case, that I'm not as sure because it's part of their proceeding. However, they're coming from individuals, not from a state or local government entity or an individual. That's actually a very good question. And I believe ultimately, it, as it goes into the record, it will need to be made as accessible as possible. Um, because I believe there was a case regarding that in 2020 or 2021 in Florida. Uh, where an attorney who was blind uh, needed uh, some accessible materials produced. Um, and I think ultimately it was found that it did need to be created, but that is a, evidence submitted by other parties is a little bit more of a gray area because they are not covered as ADA entities themselves. But excellent, um, excellent question. Uh, another question related to, I think you answered this, are searchable PDFs accessible to screen readers? They should be, pick, yes. Yeah. If they're created yeah. correctly, yes, they should be, yes. And somebody early on asked about the connection, if there is one, between the ADA and the, I believe it was the 2018 IDEA Act regarding website and material accessibility. <clears throat> I don't know if it's referring to yes. the college's ruling. 
I'm not as familiar with IDEA because I don't work in that area as yeah. much anymore. A lot of times people refer to Section 504. That comes up a lot in healthcare mm -hmm. and under the Affordable Care Act, there are accessibility requirements for websites. I'm not as sure about IDEA, but Title II and Three does cover almost every educational institution, higher ed or, or otherwise, mm -hmm. um, private or public. Religious schools would be exempt. However, if they accept federal money, whether it's a high school or a college, then they're going to be covered by Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which is tied to federal funds. So almost all educational entities with a very few exceptions are going to be covered by some law that requires electronic accessibility. I apologize. I'm not well versed on the law that was being referenced. I apologize for that. Yeah. Um, I guess if anyone else has a question, they can yeah, unmute if they'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand. Uh, Joe, I was going to post in the uh, chat, uh, the survey, uh, if you wanted to just give a little. Sure. Um, I do have, um, Sean's posting in the survey, a link. It's a short evaluation link in Qualtrics, which is a, a polling platform, uh, just to get feedback on the presentation today. If you have time to do it, it should only take you about three minutes. Uh, but we understand not everybody will. Um, if it's okay, Sean, I'll wait another minute or two. Uh, I know it's two o'clock, but for those who may want to stay on to ask a question, would that be okay with you? Okay. Does anyone have a question? I have a question, Joe. I think just from sitting in on some of the access forums that, that Sean has set up, I think this would be a good coordination, Sean. Maybe about three months ago, you had a gentleman on that went through websites and actually tested it. We actually went through that one where you tested a couple websites. I think the coordination of trying to tie these two things together would be very helpful because I think that's one of the issues, Joe, from what you brought up is trying to, you know, we're all trying to push it, you know, from um, I work for mm -hmm. municipality. I'm an administrator for municipality. So I'm always trying to make sure we stay up to compliance with whatever it is, but it's the constant part of, like you said, in the, in the bottom part, of, like at the end of your presentation, it's definitely a team effort because yeah, you know, we get things all the time from the state and the federal government that we have, you know, like mandates that we have to do. And then it's new fact sheets we have to put out, new uh, letters we have to put out. And every time you add anything to a website, you, you know, there's kind of that input of, yeah, it's baked into the cake, but then it's that process of trying to, you know, go back and actually review it. I think like a, a coordination of benefits where, you know, the things that you're pointing out with how you, how we had that double check of having that company come in or those tools that can go in and verify that it's there. That's very helpful for the, you know, like the people like me that are practitioners to make mm -hmm. sure that, you know, cause I think, the majority of us are trying to to be in compliance, but I'll tell you when I started uh, where I work now in Stafford Township, like we had a website and I said to our IT person, like, hey, we need to make sure that it's ADA compliant. Well, they go to the vendor that runs the website and says, hey, make sure it's ADA compliant and they run their little test, but that doesn't, you know, and then the test comes back, yeah, you're good, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're good. So, you know, that's, you know, trying to coordinate those two things would be very it's hard. Yeah. It is, and that's a larger question. Where it's it's making sure that it's an organization wide, even just understanding that there is this thing called accessibility for web stuff because it's you know you're you're in one role, but you know just a a county office person who's making a document that will find its way on the website. Do they know like oh I should run this accessibility checker? probably not there's a good chance they don't you know so it's making sure that the team is all on board and is aware of it that's that's a that's a very you know good point that's one of the things i heard long ago that really stuck with me is that it isn't just the people in the presentation you know if you're that need to know about accessibility it's trying to make sure everyone involved in a team effort whether it's a team of four or you know a team of a town or city or have at least some awareness of it and know sort of that this is what we need to do on a basic level, at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. Thank I you. Laura yeah. has her hand raised. Yeah, Laura. Yeah, Laura had her hand. 
Uh, yes, I'm uh, Laura Ramos. And um, uh, one, I wanted to clarify that for the Office of Administrative Law or state court question, the other party is the state. But they say they don't have to make anything readable for evidence. Are they still uh, covered by the ADA to make so that I can... <clears throat> Um, Laura, I'm gonna I, the uh, I'll give you the short answer now. But if you'll share your email with Sean, um, I I will reach out to you afterwards. I believe if you're talking about the, the state in that case, I thought you were talking uh, this. I'm, I was addressing where I was Im imagining in my head, you know, sort of a plaintiff and uh, defendant. Um, like more, well, I think I was thinking more of a civil matter. But if you're talking about where the state is involved, they probably, if there's a request, do need to make sure the material is accessible. <clears throat> but let me verify that. Um, like I said, I believe there was a court case addressing this issue uh, that was uh, settled by the Department of Justice uh, with a county in Florida uh, from several years ago. Let me look that up, and I will follow up with you one on one after. But I believe. Yes, if it's the state on one side and there's a request for accessible materials, I believe the answer is yes, because they are covered under the ADA oh, representing oh, the state. Great. Thank you. I will uh, make sure to follow up. And uh, I just thought you should know that when I'm talking about the IDEA of 2018, uh -huh. that's the 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act. That was passed by the federal oh, government. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And yeah. that the states, many states, including New Jersey, have implemented their own format for this integrated digital experience. Unfortunately, I'm finding that many state or other federal officials think that because of this act, they don't have to comply with effective communication. <sighs> no, and that's not the case. That's a core principle under Title II and III. And what's effective communication for one person may not be effective for another, depending on their disability and the type of it. So yes, that makes sense. A lot of times, not just in, in, in your, your context that you're addressing, but in others as well, people think if they meet one law's obligation, we've necessarily met other ones. And there are multiple laws that address people with disabilities. And you know, and they need to be understood and applied. Um, you know, the ADA is a larger civil rights law. It's 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 a civil right law essentially. So it's intended to be always sort of applied and intended to be a minimum standard, not not the end all and be all. Uh, organizations can go beyond it, and there'll be times where multiple laws require multiple, you know. Uh, obligations and responsibilities. And that's you know certainly the case there, meaning that law is good. The 2018, uh, now, that, now that you say, I was thinking IDEA in education setting, I had that stuck in my head. Uh, but the IDEA you were referring to, yes, meaning it is important, but you still have the general obligation under the ADA to provide effective communication. And you can't assume that everybody will have equal electronic access to start. So some people may still want paper alternatives uh, to electronic format communications. And state and local governments as I mentioned, have a higher or more weighty obligation than a business or nonprofit to provide the preferred format for the individual with a disability. Thank you, Joe. Yes, thank you. Well, I'll say thank you to everybody. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at the Northeast ADA. I'm glad to answer any questions. Jen, maybe could you put my email address in the chat in case anyone wants to email me directly sure. if you wouldn't mind for me yeah. um thank you for sharing your time today and thank you sean for hosting uh i really appreciate everyone's time i hope it was informative and again i believe sean will be sending out a pdf uh <clears throat> he'll be sending out a pdf of the slides uh that were shown today so you'll have those to review and sean i'll hand it back to you for any closing yeah. comments yeah. Yeah, thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, join us and you know, present this with this uh, valuable information. And uh, yeah, I will be following up with everybody who signed up for this uh, forum with uh, the uh, the um, sorry the PowerPoint uh, PDF that Joe had 
provided as well as the uh, questionnaire just to, you know, to have people follow up on that as well. Um, <clears throat> but I thank you all uh, for joining us for this uh, installation of the uh, Access Nature Forum, uh, where through conversation and uh, presentations, we learn how to make uh, the outdoors uh, more inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities. Uh, <clears throat> so I thank you all again for joining us. And until next time, signing off. <laughs>